Good evening, tributes, and welcome back to Tales of the Hunger Games. Thank you once again for watching, and I hope you've all had a nice week. I want to say thank you once again to my patrons for supporting me, and for Andrew McLean for providing all the art that is in this episode, and that has been here since the reclamation. The link to his website is in the description, along with plenty of other links that are associated with this series. And without further ado, let's go. The 84th Games took place in the year 96. Easter Rollicks arrived in District 10, just as the scorching temperature reached its midday peak. He and his entourage from the capital were given a tour of the district that lasted slightly longer than was planned, due to Easter asking to take a closer look at a herd of cows which he claimed to have never seen before. The reaping then went ahead as planned, and after a brief speech that was somewhat difficult to hear due to the amount of makeshift fans that were being used to fight the intense heat, Easter picked a name from the bowl of girls' names. Fifteen-year-old Lisbetta Maddox was chosen. This young lady had no family and lived on an outer farm with some fellow orphans, and they made their living by tending to the cattle together. As she heard her name, she froze, but was prodded in the back by the girl behind her to start moving, before being escorted by the peacekeepers to the platform. As she made her way between the enclosures, her orange dress was almost camouflaged within the ground below, which even made Easter squint as she made her way towards the platform, and as she walked up the steps, it was noted that she seemed to be wiping her eyes for tears. Without any further delay, Easter picked out a male name, which he announced to be 16-year-old Bolton Gutierrez. Bolton and his older brother Preston were keepers of a rather large herd of cattle within the inner farms of the district, which helped them to earn a decent income, yet even though he had never taken Tesserae, the odds this year were not in his favour. Like many of the other boys around him, Bolton was wearing a rusty orange tank top, which was a popular fashion amongst cattle herders during the reapings, in order to show off their muscular frames to cattle audiences. When the camera found him, he appeared to miss a breath and stared on as if nothing happened. Once Bolton was finally on the platform, he shook hands with Easter and Lisbetta, then Horn of Plenty was played, and the crowds were dismissed. Whilst Bolton and Lisbetta made their way into the town hall, and Easter was taken to the station in order to travel to District 9. Lisbetta was visited by her house friends, and although she was crying through the visit, she promised that if she won, she would make sure that they were all allowed to live with her in the victor's village, which stood empty at this time. Meanwhile, Bolton was visited by his brother, Preston, and his mother, although she had apparently not uttered a word since before the reclamation, and she did not choose to start at this time. Preston gave Bolton some quick advice about what to do within the arena, before he and his mother were removed and the pair were escorted to the train station. Once they were on the train, Bolton and Lisbetta quickly struck up a conversation together about their lives, and they appeared to bond over their mutual love of cows. As the journey to the capital began, the pair's mentor, Michelle Ramon, entered the carriage, and although they continued to speak about their own cows, Michelle quickly grabbed some of the food provided before stopping this conversation and focusing her tribute's attention on the upcoming week. She spoke about the parade, and how important it would be for them to make a decent impression. However, she gave them so much information about the upcoming week that they seemed a little overwhelmed. Bolton walked over to the drinks table and tried to take some whiskey, although when Michelle refused to allow him any, he became annoyed and shouted at her, even going as far as to say that if he was going to die, then at least he would like to enjoy his life beforehand. To which Michelle quickly retorted that if he listened to what she was saying, then he might actually survive. Yet this altercation resulted in Bolton storming out of the carriage with the bottle of whiskey, whilst Michelle averted her attention to Lisbetta. She seemed to look quizzically at Lisbetta's bald head, and asked her if this was a choice or a lifestyle, which confused Lisbetta, but she stated that it was rather hot where she lived, and so she liked to shave her head during the summer, which made Michelle shrug and state was rather sensible. As Bolton intoxicated himself and cried in his carriage, Michelle gave Lisbetta some more information about the upcoming week, and said that she should try to not be afraid of the career tributes, and preferably ignore them, especially during the training. She also advised Lisbetta to make an alliance with other tributes from outlying districts, such as 11 or 12. As it began to get dark, Bolton passed out in a drunken stupor on his bed, with an Avox having to stand and keep watch in his carriage in case there were any incidents during the night. Meanwhile, Michelle poured herself a drink and spoke to Lisbetta about her own daughters and how her granddaughter, Jocasta Ramon, had died in the 80th Games. Lisbetta then said that she would try to win and Michelle stated that it would be nice to not have to see another one of her young heroines die. Lisbetta retired to her room shortly afterwards and fell asleep. In the early afternoon of the next day, the train arrived in the capital, 
with Bolton, Lisbetta and Michelli being greeted by an enthusiastic capital crowd, many of whom were wearing orange clothing to welcome the tributes. Bolton still seemed rather worse for wear after his consumption the earlier day, and even pushed a lady out of his way as he got off the train, although Lisbetta happily posed for pictures with various capital citizens, and at least she seemed to make a good impression with them. The pair were then escorted to the tribute's accommodation quarters and settled in. Later, as they ate their supper, Michelli turned on the television, and they watched the reaping for District 1. Within minutes of arriving in this district, Easter had quickly been escorted to the platform at the reaping square, and he seemed to be in awe at the fine architecture and glamour of this district. He quickly started the proceedings for the talent section of the reaping, and like the citizens of this district, he watched as the nine male and eight female volunteers each showed off as many of their skills as they could within their allocated time, which was only three minutes for each tribute this year. The last lady to show her skills was a 17-year-old jewellery model named Estelle Van Roosh. She used an array of knives to rip out most of her clothes, before sensually dancing around several spears and grinding herself against them. As the three minutes came to an end, some people stated that Estelle seemed to be treating this time more like a dancing performance, but she then picked up each of the spears and hurled them at the targets with brilliant precision, hitting each of them in their exact centre. After the ladies were the gentlemen, and the most unusual display of this year's group was that of 17-year-old cage fighter Petro Jones. He simply asked for a wooden statue to be brought out, before smashing it with his bare hands and collapsing it into pieces. This display at first seemed quite odd, but as Petro began to let out some primal roars, the audience appeared to get behind him, and by the end he was being cheered. Both Estelle and Petro's unusual displays saw them through to the question and answer section. Estelle quickly showed a strong knowledge of past games, and remained sensible and grounded during her answers, whilst many of her opponents seemed to argue and make personal comments about each other. Her fine knowledge therefore saw her earn the role of female tribute for District 1. The gentleman's section followed, and Petro went into plenty of detail about how he would kill other tributes, but with such precision that the audience once again seemed to support him. Although Capital View was rather alarmed by the savage nature of this young man, he gained over 50% of the final vote, and hence became the male tribute for District 1. After a brief meeting with each of their families, both Estelle and Petro assured their parents that they would see them again after the games, and without any tears or too much emotion, they were whisked off to the station. As the train began its journey, Petro and Estelle made polite conversation with each other, and whilst the Avox, who was present, reported that they seemed to have rather different personalities, they amused each other by talking about their favourite moments of other recent games, and the funniest deaths that they had seen. Yet just after Petro joked about the coughing boy, he called the Avox over and tried to make her reenact this death. However, seeing as Avoxes are not allowed to watch the games, she had no idea of what Petro was talking about, and this frustrated him to the point that he punched the Avox in the face. A second after Petro did this, he was instantly electrocuted and fell to the floor. Estelle jumped up and looked behind to see that their mentor, Grenadino Harrington, had just used a taser on Petro, who was now convulsing on the floor. Grenadino then walked past Estelle and stood over Petro, before angrily stating that it was this sort of arrogance that had cost their district victory last year. Grenadino turned off the taser and helped Petro to his feet, but he had now wet himself, and even Estelle was struggling not to laugh. Grenadino signed to the Avox to get Petro another pair of trousers, before telling him that he was lucky that he was not on Capital TV, or he would have just lost any sponsors that might have been interested. Petro quickly nodded his head in a terrified manner, and Grenadino proceeded to properly introduce himself to the pair. Over the next hour before reaching the capital, he spoke to Estelle and Petro in detail of the upcoming week, and about what they would need to do in order to make the best impression possible with the capital. He then spent time talking about his deep hatred for Maxima Liu and Ennius Dalton, before saying that if District 2 gained another victor before District 1, then he would make life hell for Estelle and Petro's families. Yet towards the end of this talk, Grenadino reminded the pair that their best chance of victory was unfortunately dependent on their cooperation with District 2's tributes. Once they arrived in the capital, Estelle and Petro were greeted by many citizens who claimed to already be their fans, and who dressed in bold patterns of scarlet, the colour of District 1. The tributes both seemed to enjoy the attention that was lavished onto them, and when Grenadino announced that he would unfortunately have to take his tributes away to their accommodation quarters, they were cheered by these citizens, and once they were in the limousine that took them to this building, 
Grenadino congratulated them both on their strong diplomacy so far. While sat down in the vehicle, Estelle joked that it was a good job that Petro did not wet himself again, which resulted in Grenadino slapping her across the face with such force that she hit her head against the window. As Estelle proceeded to hold her face in a mixture of shock and pain, Grenadino reminded her that this was a district partner that she was talking about. For the parade the next day, Estelle and Petro were dressed in a bright scarlet dress and suit respectively, which were both dripping in shiny red diamonds. The pair put on a strong united front by holding their hands together and waving to the crowd. After the parade, Grenadino finally congratulated the pair for their unity and said that this was what he wanted to see from them throughout the games. Further down the parade, Hammer and Cress, both from Seven, were dressed in clothes made entirely of paper, which was well received by the audience, but they seemed to struggle when Hammer fainted. It is unknown why this happened to her, but Cress tried to pick her up, although being a rather small and weedy young man, he was unable to do so. As for Lisbetta and Bolton, they were dressed in white jumpsuits with large black spots, colossal horns and golden bells. Allegedly, Bolton hated wearing this outfit, but was eventually convinced by Lisbetta to do so, yet as expected the pair looked rather uncomfortable and hardly managed to wave without looking out of place. Michelli congratulated them afterwards for doing what they could with this poor design, before stating that they would need to work hard during the interviews. However, it was the twins from District 11, Robin and Magnolia, who were voted as best dressed in Anderson fashion, when they walked out in what Eugenia described as every flower of Panem strapped to their arms and legs. The training began the next day, and before entering the training room, Grenadino reminded both Petro and Estelle that they needed to work well with each other as well as the tributes from District 2, even though they would likely be despicable. However, Petro and Estelle at least seemed to get on rather well with Lotus and Talia, both from 2, and they soon began practicing with them. It seemed like the two districts were rather evenly matched, but they noticed that Panster from 9, who was using an axe and scythe just behind them, and that he was hitting his targets with strong precision. Lotus suggested that they try to recruit Panster before he allied with other tributes, and although Estelle and Petro seemed somewhat dubious about this plan, they ultimately agreed. As Estelle and Talia continued to practice with bows and arrows, Lotus and Petro approached Panster and asked him for an alliance, but they were quickly rejected, even though Panster's mentor, Jupiter's Monty, allegedly said to him later that it was a bad idea to have angered the careers like this. On the second day, the careers noticed that Voda from 3 was watching them very carefully from the material station, and so after a few minutes, Petro pretended to throw a spear at her, which did indeed scare her, and she quickly fled to a further station from where the careers were. However, Robin from 11 saw this, and in return, he pretended to throw an axe at Petro. This made Petro jump as well, and a fight broke out between him and Robin, although this was quickly separated by training Master Crane. Meanwhile, Bolton and Lisbetta each seemed to keep a low profile, and they moved between the training stations over the two days. Bolton tried to practice sword fighting with Cress from Seven, although when he realised that Cress was actually rather gifted with this skill, he instead opted to spend most of his time with Lisbetta, who had spent almost all of these two days in the camouflage station with Magnolia from Eleven. When the assessments took place the next day, Estelle opted to use spears as her main talent, and managed to score a respectable score of nine, before Petro used a collection of weapons and scored a 10, which along with Lotus and Panster, made him the highest scoring tribute for this year. Bolton showed his best efforts with a sword, although it is alleged that he had somehow managed to access some whiskey before the assessment, which affected his coordination and left him with a not so strong score of five. Whilst Lisbetta camouflaged herself within the survival station and also scored a five. Although neither of the pair did brilliantly during this section, their scores were higher than those of Lichten from 3, Carla from 4, and Moritz from 5, who each had the lowest scores of 4. The next evening, Eugenia wore an exquisite dress that was made of real alligator skin. It even had a large snout that protruded above and beneath her face. After entering the stage, and the applause eventually died down, she turned to face the crowd, and had to move her head around carefully and slowly so that the audience could see her face, which caused plenty of amusement from them. Estelle's interview was first, and she wore a fluffy scarlet dress that blended perfectly with her long black curls. While she appeared slightly quiet and intimidated compared to previous female career tributes, it was at least obvious that she knew what she was talking about when she mentioned how she had improved her skills with spears over the years. The next interview was that of Petro, who wore a sparkling scarlet suit. 
He quickly excited the crowds, and even Eugenia seemed taken aback by some of the details he gave about the cage fights that he had won when training at his academy. Aquario from 4 went down favourably with the capital, and at Eugenia's request, ripped off his shirt halfway through the interview to show his chest, which apparently annoyed both Finnick Jr. and Annie O'Dare, although this greatly excited the audience. Vital from 9, on the other hand, cried throughout her interview, and Eugenia had to ask a member of security to carry her off the stage at the end of the interview due to her legs appearing to have given way. As for Lisbetta, she wore an orange jumpsuit, and although Michelle initially asked for her to wear a wig, she refused, and Michelle eventually gave in. At the start of her interview, Lisbetta was clearly petrified by what she had seen so far, but after a bit of coaxing from Eugenia, she proceeded to tell both her and the audience about her life in District 10, which seemed to cause some genuine interest amongst both the Capitol and Eugenia. Bolton's interview followed, and he was dressed in a bright tangerine three-piece suit. He had somehow once again accessed some whiskey beforehand, but this time he seemed to have consumed just the right amount, and this made him more confident, with him even managing to share some decent banter with Eugenia. At the end of this interview, Michelle congratulated him backstage for finally making a decent impression, and he told her that he loved her, before wrapping his arms around her and accidentally knocking her onto a sofa, which prompted Michelle to order a pair of nearby Avoxes to carry him up to the accommodation quarters. The next day, tributes were taken to their holding rooms, where they were each adorned in t-shirts of their district colours, along with white trousers and clear sandals. When Grenadino visited Estelle, he reminded her to keep an eye on Lotus and Talia, but to also make sure Petro did not do anything to annoy this pair. He then visited Petro, and told him that he had the power to win these games if he acted responsibly. Michelle spoke to Bolton, and told him to try and take care of Lisbetta, but when she visited Lisbetta, she actually became quite emotional and embraced her, before saying that she wished her all the fortune that she could. The tributes then entered their tubes, and they rose into the arena. This year's games took place in an arena made of sandy dunes. The dunes were home to a variety of grassy bushes, irritable scorpions, and even some small lakes that were dotted throughout the arena. The dunes sloped upwards from the cornucopia until they reached the large rock cliffs that jutted upwards and outwards to the perimeter, which lay just a few metres beyond their summit, and due to the upward slope of the perimeter from the cornucopia, the entire arena was in fact visible from the cornucopia. The cornucopia itself lay within a small sandy basin in the centre of the arena. The 24 podiums stood around the edge of this area, and as one ran inwards, one would find a few loaves of bread and bags of fruit. There were also some backpacks and sunglasses, which had been casually tossed in front of the cornucopia. Inside the structure was a reasonable supply of spears, arrows and throwing knives. As the tributes rose into the arena, several of them immediately had to cover their eyes from the rising sun, but once they were able to see, most tributes seemed to look around at the dunes, before looking back to the cornucopia. When the countdown started, Bolton from 10, who was still on the far left podium next to Voda from 3, looked nervously around at the other tributes, before spotting Lisbetta from 10, who was stood on the centre right of the podiums, between Panster from 9 and Aquario from 4. He tried to make eye contact with her, but she seemed to be in a petrified trance. As for Petro, he was stood on the other side of Panster, with Magnolia from Eleven on his other side. Petro appeared to be signalling something to the other careers and nodding at Panster. Whilst Estelle from One, who was a few podiums to his left, acknowledged him, she moved her focus to the spears and the cornucopia, but also noticed that Robin from Eleven was looking at the weapons from the podium to her left, and this seemed to worry her to some degree, but just as she averted her focus back to these weapons, the gong sounded. Only Voda from Three and Carla from Four ran away from the cornucopia, whilst all the other tributes ran straight inwards. Yet instead of running straight forwards like these other tributes, Petro immediately sprinted to his right and tackled Panster to the ground. Panster shouted out in frustration and seemed more annoyed with Petro than he was scared of him, but within two seconds of them hitting the ground, Petro had grabbed hold of Panster's neck and twisted it with such force that it broke. Petro then jumped back up and sprinted towards the weapons. On the other hand, Estelle had run straight towards the cornucopia and was the first tribute to grab a weapon, which in her case was a spear, and she immediately ran it through the heart of the boy from eight, just as he was picking up a sword. As he fell to the ground, Estelle pointed her spear towards his district partner, 
which caused her to stumble backwards, and Talia from two then finished her off. The ladies proceeded to fend off most of the other tributes from the mouth of the Cordocopia, and hence stop them from accessing weapons. Bolton watched as the unarmed tributes began to fight each other for supplies, and so he grabbed a loaf of bread and a fruit bag instead. He looked at the Cornucopia once again, and appeared tempted by the weapons, but after watching Estelle continually stabbing the boy from six in the heart, Bolton appeared to realise that having a weapon was not worth the risk, and so he fled towards the dune behind him. Meanwhile, Lisbetta had run for her nearest loaf of bread when the gong had sounded, although just as she was picking it up, Hammer from Seven pushed her to the ground and stole the loaf before running away. Lisbetta seemed frustrated and appeared to set her sights on one of the backpacks in front of the cornucopia. She sprinted past the other tributes, most of whom were already fighting, and she grabbed a backpack, just next to where Estelle was stabbing the boy from six. Although luckily for Lisbetta, Estelle did not seem to notice her. Lisbetta then ran past the fighting tributes, but just as she appeared to have escaped the main danger zone, she was suddenly tackled to the ground by Lotus from two. During this time, Petro had got back up after having snapped Panster's neck, and fortunately for him, Talia and Estelle let him pass them and enter the cornucopia, which allowed him to grab a set of throwing knives. Petro then ran out of the cornucopia to see that most of the unarmed tributes were fighting each other for supplies, which made it easy for him to target them. He proceeded to throw knives at the boy from 12, and then the girl from 5, which killed each of them within seconds. As most tributes quickly realised how much danger they were in, they finally started to flee from the range of Petro's knives. Petro then looked ahead to see Lotus trying to run a knife through Lisbetta's neck, although she was putting up a desperate fight to stop it from piercing her skin. After looking round to see that Talia was chasing after Alice from 12, and realising that this could be a brilliant opportunity to eliminate Lotus, Petros ran straight ahead, and just as Lotus finally ran the knife through Lisbetta's neck, Petro stabbed him in the back of the head. Lotus then collapsed onto Lisbetta, whose breathing was beginning to slow, and Petro quickly placed this knife in Lisbetta's hand as she died, presumably in order to make it seem that she had killed Lotus. Estelle came out of the cornucopia to see Petro walking back towards her, and with a cheeky wink, said that Talia was hopefully too distracted to see what he had just done to Lotus. Whilst Estelle and Petro watched Talia falling over in the sand beyond the cornucopia, they started gathering the remaining supplies together, and she marched back towards them. Yet when Talia began to realise that Lotus was dead, she swore loudly, and after noticing that Lisbetta still had some life left in her, Talia grabbed the knife from her hand and thrust it through her brain. The filming then cut to the studio for the first time, and whilst Crane stated that Talia seemed to have no idea of who had really killed her district partner, Eugenia mentioned that this was indeed rather cunning of Petro. Over the next few minutes, the bodies of the fallen tributes were taken by the hovercraft, whilst Petro, Estelle, and Talia collected the remaining supplies, and buried all the spare weapons beneath the sand within the cornucopia. Once this process was complete, they looked around to see which of the fleeing tributes they should follow, but to their dismay, they failed to see any. After some discussion, the trio eventually decided to head to the western edge of the arena, and as they began to walk along the western dune, they heard nine cannons sounding. As for Bolton, he had continued sprinting south after escaping from the bloodbath. He travelled up the nearest dune for the next few minutes, and only looked back occasionally in order to check that nobody was coming after him. Once he had reached a comfortable distance, he hid behind a bush and saw Petro stabbing Lotus in the back of the head, although he seemed to be having trouble working out whose body Lotus was lying on top of. Yet after appearing to notice the orange t-shirt that Lisbetta was wearing, he swore out loud before vomiting. Some viewers in Snow Square joked that they were not sure if this was due to his district partner's death, or the alcohol that he had consumed the day before. Yet after watching the careers gather the supplies, he spoke to himself in a tense and worried manner when he seemed to be calculating which direction the careers would travel. At one point, they seemed to be coming in his direction, which made him swear in a panic, but when they turned to their right and headed east instead, he let out a relieved sigh. However, when the nine cannons sounded just a few seconds later, Bolton jumped and fell straight forwards. He coughed on some of the thick sand, but quickly tried to get back up, although it was then that he saw a large scorpion just inches from his face, and he let out a quiet yet petrified murmur before scrambling to his feet. The scorpion quickly turned around and scurried towards Bolton, but as he got up, he kicked it away. He then saw more scorpions approaching, and so he ran as quickly as he could in a southeast direction, until he reached an area with a lot more bushes, where it was easier to hide. He entered this area so quickly that he tripped on the branches of one of these bushes, but as he got up, he looked forward and saw that there were several lakes ahead, 
He then proceeded to help himself to water from one of these lakes, and after checking that there were no scorpions in the vicinity, he proceeded to rest within the bushes. Petro, Estelle, and Talia had continued to head upwards through the western dunes. Although they came close to discovering Vital from Nine, who had practically submerged herself in some nearby sand, the trio continued on to the edge of the arena. When they reached the bottom of the cliff at the edge of the arena, Talia stated that she did not want to climb up to the top, as it seemed dangerous, but Petro insisted that they did so, in order to have a better view of the arena. Although Estelle initially seemed hesitant about climbing this cliff, she seemed to remember what Grenadino had said about supporting one's district partner, and so she took Petro's side. They spent quite a bit of time finding a section of the cliff that could be climbed, but they eventually found a part that was less steep and had many footholds, which they proceeded to climb, and within an hour, they were stood on top of the cliff, just metres from the perimeter. They each looked out in different directions, and Petro commented that he had never seen such a beautiful place, before Talia reminded him that they needed to look for other tributes. This caused the pair to squabble, but just as the shouting was beginning, Estelle told them that she could see someone trying to climb the cliff just a few metres to their right. The trio looked more carefully, and realised that Estelle was indeed correct. They then headed to their right along the top of the cliff, and after less than five minutes of travelling in this direction, Estelle shushed them, and they realised that they could hear an exhausted grunting that was approaching them from below. Petro very quietly got his sword ready, and mouthed to the girls that he would deal with whomever this was, all whilst the sound of grunting came nearer and nearer. After a few excited moments, the head of Lichten from Three finally came into view as he reached the top of the cliff. Lichten seemed to be rather exhausted and out of breath, and did not initially look up to see who awaited him, but when he opened his eyes to see three pairs of feet facing him, his expression was that of pure horror. He seemed to become even more scared as his gaze travelled upwards to see Petro's grinning face and the sword in his hand, before letting out a petrified roar and appearing too scared to even consider what action to take. Petro brought his sword down onto Lichten's fingers that were holding onto the top of the cliff, and his grip on the rock was quickly released. Lichten screamed as he fell backwards, which made Petro laugh and a cannon was subsequently heard. Talia suggested staying in this location, as it also had a good view of the arena, but when the hovercraft came to collect Lichten's body, Estelle mentioned that other tributes might now know their location, and so they should continue along the edge of the cliff, which they proceeded to do. After approximately ten minutes, the trio were in the northern cliffs of the arena, and as the sun started to set, they rested there and ate some bread. Although they had plenty of food, neither of them had any water, and they were clearly starting to become thirsty after the events of that day. But just as they were discussing how they could access water, the three of them were each gifted with a bottle of water, for which they thanked their sponsors. Meanwhile, Bolton rested in the bushy area of lakes that he had found earlier. He had not seen any other tributes, and although he noticed the hovercraft retrieving Lichten's body, he was relieved to see that this was far away from his location, and so he decided to stay put. After eating a little more fruit, he covered himself in one of the bushes, before falling asleep in exhaustion. During this time, the careers took turns to keep a lookout from their vantage point at the top of the cliff. The first half of the evening was relatively uneventful, but shortly before midnight, Estelle, who was taking watch at this time, stated that she could see a fire burning close to the cornucopia. Talia immediately surveyed this site and grabbed her bow and arrow, whilst claiming that they should attack whoever had set this fire. However, Estelle pointed out that it could be a trap, and that they should therefore approach with caution. Petro then stated that there was only one way for them to find out, and so they quickly gathered their weapons and started to climb down the cliff face. They realised that there were many footholds in this section of the rocks, which made it much easier for them to climb up and down this cliff. Once they were on the ground, they quietly yet carefully ran towards the cornucopia, where they could see this fire, that someone had managed to start by setting a rather large bush alight. They slowed down when they were approximately 200 metres from the fire, but they could not see anyone around this fire, and so Estelle reiterated that this must be a trap. The trio readied their weapons and very slowly approached the fire, whilst looking around as much as possible. They proceeded to poke each surrounding bush with their weapons, in order to check that no tributes were somehow hiding behind or underneath them. However, just as Talia thought she saw something suspicious hiding behind one of the bigger bushes, Alice from Twelve suddenly appeared from behind the burning bush and threw a large rock in Estelle's direction. Estelle quickly ducked, and the rock missed her, but Talia shot an arrow that hit Alice in the shoulder. Although this knocked her to the ground and caused her to cry out in pain, it was apparent that it would not be enough to kill her, 
Petro then walked over to Alice and picked her up onto his shoulder. Talia and Estelle both asked Petro what he was doing with Alice, who was now shouting in both pain and terror. But when he began to walk to the burning bush, Talia looked somewhat impressed, whilst Estelle gasped and shouted at Petro to wait. Estelle and Talia caught up with Petro when he was stood by the burning bush. He looked into the fire for a few seconds, whilst Alice continued to beg for mercy, and Estelle asked him to kill her quickly, but he appeared oblivious to what was happening, and just as a collective scream of shock erupted in Snow Square, Petro threw Alice from his shoulder and straight at the raging inferno in front of him. Alice's screams were heard throughout the arena, and Bolton was one of several tributes who was awoken by the sound of screams and the sight of fire. He looked over into the distance, and as he saw a burning figure emerge from the fire and stumble away while still on fire, he shuddered and hid himself back down within the bushes. The careers slowly made their way back to their previous resting area, and they eventually heard Alice's cannon sound. A few minutes later, the fallen were shown, and the portraits of Lotus from 2, Lichten from 3, the girl from 5, both tributes from 6, both tributes from 8, Panster from 9, Lisbetta from 10, and the boy and Alice from 12 were all shown in the sky, which meant that only 13 tributes now remained. Shortly before arriving at the cliff, Talia noticed the scorpions running close to them, and she stated that whoever was keeping watch would have to pay attention for these animals as well. Once they had reached the top of the cliff, Talia tried to ask Petro and Estella who or where they should aim to target the next day, but this pair seemed extremely tired after the action of the day, and so Talia agreed to keep the first watch whilst they slept. The night was relatively uneventful throughout the arena, but tributes began to get up as the sun rose the next day. Bolton was one of the first tributes to awaken, and he seemed rather confused about where he was, until he looked to his right to see a rather large scorpion making its way towards him. He quickly jumped up, and whilst trying to keep down from the view of other tributes, he ran away from the scorpion to the other side of the bushy area in which he had stayed so far. Shortly after Bolton settled once more, Estelle, who had taken the last watch, deemed it time for Petro and Talia to get up, and so she woke them. The trio ate some bread and fruit whilst discussing which way they should head, and they eventually agreed to head to their left, and hence enter the eastern cliffs of the arena, where they rested for just over two hours. Bolton spent this time resting within the bushes, but when he saw a rather large nest of scorpions approaching him through the bushes once more, he quickly gathered his supplies and fled beyond the bushes. Apparently realising that game maker Whimsywick was trying to move him away from the safety of the southern bushes, Bolton continued and after a few minutes entered the dunes on the east side of the arena before eventually settling by the bottom of the cliff. He rested within the crevices of these cliffs and was unknowingly sat only a few hundred metres from the careers, yet just as he looked like he may fall asleep once again, he suddenly saw someone walking from the cornucopia and in his direction. He quickly hid within a nearby bush and saw this figure get closer which was revealed to be Aquario from 4. However, it was not only Bolton who had spotted Aquario approach. Estelle had also spotted him from the viewpoint at the top of the cliffs. She alerted the other careers to his presence, and they quickly lay down, so that they could not be seen above the cliffs. Yet after seeing Aquario head slightly to their left, they carefully headed along the top of the cliffs in this direction, whilst trying not to be seen. As Aquario moved nearer, Bolton seemed excited by the fact that Aquario had a set of throwing knives strapped around his waist, and Eugenia stated that Bolton definitely had his eye on them. Aquario appeared to be examining the cliffs for a suitable climbing point, but when he was only approximately 100 metres from the nearest cliff, and a shorter distance from the bush behind which Bolton was hiding, an arrow suddenly shot through the air and hit Aquario in the temple. Bolton gasped, before quickly putting his hand over his mouth after realising the sound he had just made. He tried to look up at the cliffs behind him, and he heard Talia whooping with joy, not far to his right. As Aquario began to lose his balance, Petro congratulated Talia for the precision of this shot, and the pair laughed as Aquario fell to the floor. Estelle could be seen behind them with a rather bewildered expression on her face, and Crane said that he would not be surprised if she was the first one to turn within this group. Meanwhile, Bolton was on the ground at the bottom of the cliffs, and he too seemed rather confused by the sounds of laughter coming from above but he then appeared to realise that this was in fact the career pack who were above him. A cannon subsequently sounded, and the hovercraft came over the horizon, before slowing as it reached Aquario's body. Yet when the claws began to drop from the craft, Bolton quickly jumped up and ran towards the body. Talia and Petro had been excitedly chatting on top of the cliff, but Estelle, who was still watching, shouted at them to be quiet, before alerting them to Bolton, 
who had just reached Aquario's body. As he grabbed the knives from Aquario's pocket, Talia got her bow and arrow ready and proceeded to shoot three arrows in succession at Bolton as he escaped. The first two arrows failed to hit him, however the third managed to hit him in the lower back. Bolton gasped in pain as this last arrow hit him, but despite stumbling slightly, he continued to run, and the hovercraft soon moved on. Talia had no more arrows, and the trio quickly examined the cliffs below in order to see where they could climb down from them. They frantically ran along each side in search of a descendable cliff, whilst Bolton continued to sprint towards the cornucopia. But once they finally found a cliff with a lighter slope and usable footholds, Bolton was out of sight, and was in fact resting within another bushy area that was close to the cornucopia. The career pack then roamed around the east side of the arena and examined each bush in order to see if a tribute was hiding there, but as the sun began to set, they gave up searching and rested at the bottom of the eastern cliff, close to where Aquario had been killed. Bolton lay in the bushes by the cornucopia for the next few hours and seemed like he would fall asleep, yet just after closing his eyes, he suddenly forced them open when he heard two tributes talking, and as his expression appeared to become more terrified, he sneakily raised his head above the bush that was covering him to see Magnolia and Robin, both from Eleven, walking in his direction. Bolton grabbed a knife in each hand and held them at the ready as the pair got nearer, but when they were within just a hundred meters of his location, Hammer, from Seven, suddenly jumped up from a bush that this pair were about to pass, and she sprinted towards Magnolia with a sword in her hand. Magnolia screamed, and Robin practically threw her to the floor and away from the range of Hammer's sword. Hammer swiped at Robin and very nearly hit him several times, but he just about managed to defend himself with his spear. However, Hammer did not see that when Magnolia had fallen, she had almost hit a scorpion. Without seeming to be afraid, Magnolia picked up the scorpion whilst her brother was fighting Hammer, before sneaking backwards and managing to place herself behind Hammer, who was still trying to stab Robin with her sword. Yet just as Hammer sliced Robin's arm with her sword, Magnolia seized her moment and threw the scorpion at the back of Hammer's head, and it proceeded to grip on extremely tightly, which made Hammer scream. Robin then used the distraction to thrust the spear through Hammer's heart, and she collapsed to her knees. This resulted in blood spraying onto Robin's green t-shirt, but as he looked at this stain with a disgusted expression, Magnolia pointed at Bolton, who had used this distraction to run. Hammer's cannon sounded, and Magnolia grabbed the sword and shouted at Robin that they needed to catch Bolton, but Robin seemed to have sprained his ankle during the fight, and he shouted in pain quickly after beginning to run. Magnolia looked back at Robin and Eugenia stated that now would be a good time to finish him off, but Crane said that he doubted that this pair would turn on each other until the bitter end. Magnolia then appeared to realise that Robin would not be able to run after Bolton, and so she sat down with him in the bushes, and the pair ate some of their fruit. As the darkness set in, Bolton made his way into the western side of the arena, before hiding within a large bush about halfway between the cornucopia and the cliffs, whereas the careers wandered into the northern quarter of the arena, where they rested by the bottom of these cliffs, and kept a lookout through the night. Although these games have produced a rather exciting bloodbath, many viewers that have been watching in Snow Square seemed to lose interest as the day went on, probably due to the vast majority of tributes simply hiding in bushes, and the lack of interaction between these tributes. Eugenia and Crane did their best to bring some interest to the goings-on of the arena, but this seemed rather difficult even for them, due to the lack of action. At midnight, the portraits of Aquario from Four and Hammer from Seven were each shown in the sky, which now left eleven tributes remaining. The next day, most tributes awoke as the sun rose, but they all remain in the places where they have been sleeping during the night, which continued to result in a lack of action. However, once midday came by, the career trio finally made a move and headed towards the centre of the arena. They walked past Carla from four on their way there, although fortunately for her, she remained hidden beneath some bushes and was not seen by the careers. Yet when they were almost halfway towards the cornucopia, they suddenly heard a cannon and looked around to see that a large cloud of sand was beginning to form at the edge of the arena. As Petro and Talia looked behind them and questioned why the sand had gathered like this, Estelle looked around and pointed out that there was a sandstorm coming from the top of the cliffs and flowing down into the centre of the arena. Like almost every other tribute, the careers started running and back in the studio, Eugenia announced that this cannon had belonged to Cress from Seven, who had been stood upon a cliff and was suddenly blasted when sand had entered through a nearby vent, which had stopped him from being able to see and caused him to stumble off the cliff to his death.
However, as many of these tributes ran in, a communication issue occurred within the control room regarding the operation of the central roof vents, which caused the amount of sand in the arena to dramatically increase, not just within the outer areas, but also towards the centre, and within a minute, almost all of the arena, except for the cornucopia, was being ravaged by a sandstorm. Almost instantly, the vast majority of tributes were choking on the sand and getting sand in their eyes, which was causing them to scream out in pain. As the careers ran through the storm, they placed their hands to cover their eyes, which did stop a lot of sound entering their eyes, but they were still coughing just as much as the other tributes, and when they were close to reaching the cornucopia, Talia suddenly collapsed to the ground, and it was later revealed that this was due to a rather large twig from one of the bushes having been blown into her mouth during the storm. She collapsed to the ground and spluttered as even more sand entered her mouth. Although Petro desperately tried to help her, his eyes were hit by more sand, and Estelle grabbed him by the hand and forced him onwards to the cornucopia, where they could just about see that there was less sand blowing through the air. They continued running, just as Talia stopped being able to breathe, and her cannon sounded. Meanwhile, Bolton had also run from the storm, although due to the amount of sand that was swirling through the air around him, he was unable to see where he was going, and as he began to splutter from the sand that had entered his throat, more sand entered his eyes, and within a minute, he could be heard to shout that he could not see. As he collapsed and most other tributes were struggling to see or breathe, Petro and Estelle finally stumbled into the cornucopia, and spent several minutes coughing and trying to wipe their eyes. For the next hour, the storm continued to rage around them, and they cowered within the cornucopia. Crane mentioned that Estelle seemed to be having trouble seeing from her right eye, which had been badly hit by sand during the storm, although she did not mention this to Petro. During this time, it was also very difficult for Crane and Eugenia to commentate on the events that were occurring around the arena, due to the storm making it difficult to see anything from the cameras that had not been buried by sand. Yet after almost an hour, the power to the events was finally cut, and the storm gradually began to wind down. When they were once again able to see the cliffs from the cornucopia, Petro and Estelle tentatively looked out to see that the arena now looked somewhat different. The dunes had been vastly reshaped, and were now rather uneven, whilst only a handful of the bushes were unburied by sand. However, this helped them to see more of the tributes, who were now writhing in pain, with many of them shouting that they could not see, and seemingly giving up on trying to hide themselves. Although Petro and Estelle had lost their weapons during the storm, they remembered that they had buried several within the cornucopia shortly after the games began. Over the next few minutes, Estelle managed to access a new spear, and Petro took a pair of swords before they set off to the nearest tribute that they could see, who was just a few hundred metres into the western section of the arena. As they approached this tribute, Petro said that it was Voda from Three, who still seemed to be coughing up sand, even though the storm had ended several minutes earlier. Estelle also concluded that as Voda had not reacted to them, she must have lost her sight during the storm, which Eugenia confirmed. Petro giggled as Voda tried to get back up, which prompted her to ask who was there in a rather panicked tone. She cried and screamed as she heard Petro circling her, but she proceeded to get up and she tried to run. Petro tripped her up as she fled, and a few seconds later, he put her out of her misery by stabbing her with the sword. Estelle did not appear to be enjoying this scene, and as Voda's cannon sounded and Petro laughed, she snarled at him from behind. They continued to head towards the cliffs, and within a few minutes, they approached Carla from four, who was slowly stumbling towards the cliffs. She appeared to have lost her sight, and Estelle could see that she was about to walk straight into a bed of scorpions, which she pointed out to Petro. He proceeded to run ahead in front of Carla, who did not notice him, and he grabbed one of the scorpions, before holding it in front of where Carla was about to walk. She proceeded to walk straight into the scorpion, and screamed with horror, before waving her arms around when she heard Petro laughing. She tried running in the opposite direction, but fell over when she tripped on an exposed bush, and cried out as she hit the ground. Estelle then watched as Petro cackled, and grabbed another scorpion, but just as he walked over to Carla, Estelle readied her spear. Over the next few seconds, Petro was getting ready to place the scorpion on the head of Carla, who was still shouting and trying to get back up, but Estelle suddenly launched her spear at Petro, which went flying through his left lung, and he fell to the ground. Carla shouted out and asked what was happening, but as the bed of scorpions made its way to Petro, who was now struggling for breath, Estelle grabbed the spear before jamming it through the back of Carla's head. As she fell forwards and her cannon sounded, Estelle said that she was sorry, before looking back at Petro, 
who was still looking at Estelle in disbelief, whilst the scorpions crawled towards him. Estelle gave Petro a look of disgust as he begged for mercy, but she chose to leave him, and she walked back to the cornucopia. Over the next hour, Petro was continually bitten by the scorpions and unable to move, which eventually led to a painful death from the poisonous venom that these creatures held in their pincers. As Estelle rested in the cornucopia and the sun began to set, the cannon of Vital also sounded when she chose to stab herself in the heart. During this time, Bolton had made his way to the cliffs at the edge of the arena, where he was continually rubbing his eyes and trying to regain his vision. He began to panic more and more as the evening went on and cried as the sun began to set. After almost an hour of darkness, he heard a sponsorship gift coming down towards him, and he immediately got up and tried to grab it, although in the process of trying to retrieve it from the ground, he accidentally walked into the cliff behind him and cut his hand against the rock. By accident, Bolton kicked the sponsor gift along the ground before eventually picking it up. He pulled out a bottle that Crane announced to be an advanced kind of eye drops, although after shaking it and hearing that it was a liquid, he proceeded to open it and tentatively sipped the contents. After a few minutes, Bolton appeared to realise that something was wrong, and he got up and vomited, before crying some more and shouting out in frustration, seemingly not caring that he was still in the arena. However, he then appeared to realise what this liquid might be for, and he applied the drops to his eyes. Eugenia congratulated him, and the crowds in Snow Square cheered, but much to the embarrassment of the sponsors and capital medics, an hour went by with no improvement in Bolton's sight, and he ultimately threw the remains of the bottle at the cliff in frustration. Bolton then proceeded to slump down in tears against the cliff, and within a few minutes he appeared to already be asleep. Meanwhile, Estelle had left the cornucopia and was wandering through the arena and looking for other tributes. It was rather difficult for her to see through the darkness, and she very warily approached each bush that she could see, in order to check that nobody was about to attack her, but just as she was about to reach the southern cliffs, she saw Robin and Magnolia walking along a nearby dune. During the storm, Robin had managed to keep his eyes protected, and was therefore still able to see, but Magnolia had not been so fortunate, and due to her having opened her eyes after choking, she was now having to rely on her brother to guide her. As they walked onwards, Estelle quietly readied her spear, and walked towards them through the dark, and they seemed unable to see her. When she was within 50 metres of this pair, Estelle readied her spear, before throwing it as hard as she could at Robin's head, which it proceeded to hit, and his cannon sounded before he had even fallen to the ground. Magnolia gasped and appeared to realise what had happened. She then shouted out and cried, unaware of what was happening around her. To the audience's surprise, she began to run in Estelle's direction, and Crane pointed out that she was probably unaware of which direction the spear had come from. Estelle watched in a somewhat mournful manner, as Magnolia unknowingly ran towards her, but when she was only a few metres away, Estelle threw her spear, and without any further sound, Magnolia fell to the floor, and her cannon sounded. As the hovercraft collected the bodies, Estelle walked back to the cliffs, and proceeded to rest there. She looked up at the cliffs and seemed tempted to climb them, possibly for safety, but she seemed to decide against it, and remained at the bottom. Whilst Bolton slept and Estelle started to fall asleep, the portraits of Petro from one, Talia from two, Voda from three, Carla from four, Cress from 7, Vital from 9, and Robin and Magnolia from 11 were all shown, which left only Estelle from 1, Moritz from 5, and Bolton from 10 remaining. Throughout the night, all three tributes appeared to have difficulty sleeping. Moritz in particular was in intense pain due to a scorpion bite that he had received the night before, and shortly before sunrise, he succumbed to his injuries and his cannon sounded. Estelle and Bolton were now the only remaining tributes, and they were awoken when Game Maker Whimsywick announced that they had five minutes to be in the cornucopia before another sandstorm was triggered. Estelle quickly got up and ran from the cliffs, but Bolton, who once again seemed dismayed to not be able to see, initially walked into the cliffs, before sighing and turning round to sprint towards the cornucopia. The pair both ran inwards, whilst the crowds in Snow Square screamed in excitement at the imminent showdown. Although Estelle seemed like the clear favourite to win, Crane mentioned that you never know what would happen in these games, and that Bolton was strong enough to overpower Estelle if he got the opportunity. Despite falling over twice on the way to the cornucopia, Bolton arrived in the central basin before Estelle, probably due to his larger stature. When he arrived, he almost ran into the cornucopia itself, but seemed to sense its presence, and in the moments before Estelle also made it to the cornucopia, Bolton quickly felt around for anything that he could use for a weapon, 
but to no avail. As Estelle then rather calmly entered this area, Bolton got up and turned to face her. Just when Estelle was readying her spear, Bolton shouted at her to stop, which seemed to confuse her, before stating that he did not know who was there or what weapons this person had on them, but that he dared them to fight empty-handed against him for a fair fight. Cheers of anticipation were heard throughout Snow Square, and Eugenia squealed with excitement as Bolton aimlessly grinned, and the cameras cut back to Estelle, who seemed to be in two minds. To the joy of many citizens throughout Panem, Estelle grinned and dropped her spear, before telling Bolton to bring it on. They neared each other and the fighting began. Estelle was about to punch Bolton, but he dodged and proceeded to punch her in the face. She fell to her left and looked back, but likely due to the lack of vision in her right eye, she was unable to see Bolton with this eye, and so she ran forward, but he kicked her away which knocked her back once more and made Bolton laugh. He then jumped forward in Estelle's direction, and while she was on the floor, she kicked her leg up towards Bolton's groin, and he gasped and fell back in pain, but just as Estelle tried to get back up, he jumped into the air with his elbow protruding outwards, and when he fell onto Estelle, this elbow hit her in the stomach, which appeared to knock the wind out of her lungs. Bolton then mounted on top of Estelle and punched her in the face repeatedly before stopping for a few seconds. But just as he was about to punch her again, Estelle managed to grab some sand, which he threw into Bolton's open mouth. He proceeded to choke and cough this sand all over Estelle, which allowed her to wriggle from his grip. As she ran towards her spear, Bolton ran after the sound of her footsteps, and although he almost caught her, she managed to grab her spear in time, and she pointed it towards Bolton's heart. He proceeded to sprint towards her, and subsequently impaled his heart on the spear, which ceased his movement. Bolton coughed out some blood as he stood there, and he began to collapse to the floor. Estelle, who was now clearly exhausted as well, fell to the floor shortly after Bolton, and as his breathing slowed, she crawled over to him and held his hand. He gripped back onto Estelle's hand, and she said that Bolton had almost beaten her. This made him laugh, and within a few seconds his cannon sounded. As Estelle fell backwards in exhaustion, it was announced that Estelle Van Roosh from District 1 was the winner of the 84th Hunger Games, and she was airlifted to safety, even though she later mentioned that she had no memory of this happening. For the victor's interview, Eugenia wore a dress that strongly resembled the body of a scorpion. Needless to say, she was loudly applauded as she entered the stage, and as she spoke to the audience, she made them laugh by waving her pincers around in time with her speech. Estelle then came out in a sandy-coloured tulle dress, and was interviewed by Eugenia. Although she confirmed that she no longer had vision in her right eye, she stated that she was already experiencing the benefits of victory, and so she was content. Many of her kills were shown and analysed, and Eugenia applauded Estelle for being brave enough to fight Bolton on his own terms at the end, although she also stated that many capital citizens had thought she was crazy for taking this chance, as he had very nearly killed her. But Estelle mentioned that if she was going to win, she wanted to do it in a manner that was as fair as possible. However, despite Estelle being a popular victor, these games were looked on relatively unfavourably, due to the lack of action and the malfunctioning main event, which caused the games to end somewhat prematurely. Game maker Whimsywick therefore chose to retire, and he moved to the European lands before the victor's interview had even taken place. In the coming years, Estelle took on the role of mentor for both tributes of District 1, and she continued to work with Grenadino for advice on this role. The pair later started dating, and eventually got married, before having two sons, who went on to be leading students at District 1's training academy. <laughs>